Hello, my name is Dr. Yoshi Katsura, and I'm a board-certified orthopedic spine surgeon practicing in Northern California. Today we're going to be talking about spinal fusions, which is probably one of the most common surgical procedures that spine surgeons do. It's also a procedure that patients have a lot of questions about. Questions like, what is a spine fusion? What does that mean? Will it help me? Will it hurt me? What are some common types of lumbar spinal fusions? What does an A-lift mean? What does an X-lift mean? What does a T-lift mean? These are words that are commonly thrown around in a spine clinic. And finally, what's the recovery process? And what are some of the issues with spinal fusions? We're going to talk about all these things today. So what is a spinal fusion? A spinal fusion is when two vertebrae actually grow together, meaning that the bones are no longer separated by a disc and they move in unison, they're connected by adjoining bone. Spinal fusions can occur spontaneously in such settings as advanced degeneration or advanced arthritis, or even in certain specific diseases such as ankylosing spondylitis. These are processes that occur through the body's own biology and cause the bones to grow together. They can be natural. Uh, spinal fusions can also be the way that your body takes care of certain problems. So if you do have a slip disc that is becoming extremely unstable, that's your body's way of trying to stabilize it. Spinal fusions can also be done surgically, meaning that we actually surgically put rods and screws in to try to get the bones to grow together and become stable. Uh, in this case, we use bone grafts to essentially encourage the body to grow these two bones together and we use orthopedic hardware to stabilize the bones so they don't move and have an easier time growing together. So here's a little cartoon showing how a spinal fusion can occur spontaneously. You can see that there's two vertebrae and over time the disc that has separated them gradually becomes replaced with bones so that in the end you just have one bone. So what are spinal fusions used for? Spinal fusions are really excellent as a reconstructive type of procedure, meaning they can be used to realign a deformed spine. They can be used to stabilize things like fractures or if there's some sort of destructive process ongoing in your spine, such as from a tumor, spinal fusions are great at stabilizing those types of issues. They're also really good at stabilizing an unstable spine. So if you have a slipped disc or some other problem resulting in abnormal motion in your spine, spinal fusions can help stabilize that. Spinal fusions cannot cure all back diseases. They cannot cure all generic low back pain. And it really is very specific as to whether a spinal fusion will help you and your surgeon can help make that determination. So for example, conditions such as spondylolisthesis, there's a spinal deformity, there's a slipped disc, spinal fusions work great for these. So what are the basic concepts for spinal fusions? We use orthopedic hardware to hold the bones together. The pedicle screws and rod systems act as stabilizers that prevent motion at the site of the spinal fusion. The cages act as a false disc to support the inner body space and can help restore the normal shape of the spine. The bone graft is used to actually grow the bones together. So the spinal hardware just hold things in place until the bone graft can take and the bones actually grow together. There are several different sources for bone graft. The first is what's called autograft, which is bone that's harvested from your spine or other areas in your body. This tends to be the best at forming a spinal fusion because it's actually from your body and has biology that's compatible with yours. But there are other sources such as from cadavers, which is processed dead person bone. And that may sound strange, but it's actually inert, sort of like a dead coral. It's been processed and highly filtered and cleaned so that it's appropriate for surgical implantation. The last would be synthetic sources, which are bone that's grown in a lab that we also use to augment spinal fusions. So let's take a look at how this all works. The first thing that we do in surgery is try to remove the old damaged disc. This sets the stage for the spinal fusion where the cage can be inserted. The cage reconstructs the spinal space and realigns the spine. After this, we typically inject some bone graft or put some bone graft into the cage and that allows the two bones to grow together quite readily. We stabilize the entire construct with screws that are usually implanted from the back of the spine or posterior in the spine and these are connected by rods. You may have a decompression that is cleaning out of the spinal canal around the nerves to decompress them. That can be part of a spinal fusion as well. Over time, the spinal fusion will heal together such that the screws and rods really are accessory at that point. 
they may not be necessary because the bones, once grown together, are strong enough to hold the two vertebrae. So what are the different types of spinal fusions? I think this is another area that is very confusing for patients. We use a lot of acronyms in spine surgery, which can be quite complicated, and so I wanted to spend some time going over that. Basically, all of the different types of spine surgeons are some kind of LIF, L-I-F and that stands for lumbar interbody fusion. And basically what that means is that some kind of cage is being implanted in the inner body space, so in the disc space, and the, the first letter that comes before the LIF is the type of cage and the direction from which it's being implanted. So for example, a T-LIF is implanted from the posterior through the back, and it stands for transforaminal lumbar inner body fusion, which means it's actually placed through the foramina in the spine, which is just an anatomic direction. The next type is called an ALIF, which stands for anterior lumbar interbody fusion, and that means that actually the cage is placed through the abdomen uh, directly from the front of the spine. Finally, another common type of spinal fusion is called an X-LIF, which stands for extreme lateral. It can also be called an L-LIF, which just stands for lateral lumbar inner body fusion and the cage in that case is placed through the flank or through the side of the body. I'll go through each one of these in turn. In a T-lift, the cage is inserted from the posterior aspect of the body or through the back and is placed through an anatomic canal known as the transforaminal approach. In an A-lift, the cage is actually placed through the abdomen, so an approach is made moving the abdominal contents aside and the cage is placed directly anterior into the spine. In an X-lift or lateral approach, the cage is placed through the flank moving the abdominal contents aside, as you can see here. There's no question that spinal fusions are major operations and should only be performed by qualified, fellowship-trained spine surgeons. There are pretty specific types of risks to doing this type of surgery and some that are more common than others. I'm gonna highlight a couple that I think are important to know. The first is that the discs above and below a spinal fusion can wear out. That's called adjacent segment degeneration. It occurs in about 15% of patients over five years after the procedure. The next unique complication that can occur in a spinal fusion is called a pseudarthrosis. That's when the bones actually fail to grow together and can lead to hardware failure. The spinal fusions are designed to take away motion from the spine. We want them to be totally static after the procedure is performed. If they move, that can cause problems. If you have enough vertebrae fused, this can result in stiffening of the spine or feelings of immobility. There are other complications that are common to spine surgery, and I made a video on this. I suggest you just take a look at that to learn about those in greater detail. In a pseudarthrosis, the bones fail to grow together, and so the supporting hardware eventually can wear out and become loose. In adjacent segment degeneration, the spine loses some of its motion, and this does place some added stress on the discs above and below, which can wear out. Finally, I'd like to talk about the recovery after a spinal fusion. I like to discuss this in terms of two factors. The first is pain, and the second is the actual healing of the bony fusion. The pain from a spinal fusion can be very intense and tends to be mainly concentrated in the first two weeks after the procedure. After this, it gradually declines to a point where you're feeling pretty comfortable by about six weeks and about three months, you're feeling almost back to normal. The healing of the bone, however, takes longer. Most of the healing actually occurs within the first three months to where it's about 60 to 70% healed. However, after this point, your bones will continue to heal even though you may not be aware of it. This is the honeymoon period. You have to be very careful during this period because you may not have pain, but are still not fully healed. In conclusion, spinal fusions are when two vertebrae grow together. This can be accomplished either naturally or can be done with surgical intervention. It's important to note that spinal fusions cannot treat all low back problems. They're only designed for very specific instances. It's also important to remember that there are risks involved with spinal fusion surgery and that this is major surgery. Finally, it's important to note that the healing process takes upwards of one year. Thanks so much for your attention. If you like this video, you can subscribe. As time allows, I'll probably make more in the future.